Okay, uh, thank you for your interesting uh, presentation. I have a question about uh, uh, correlation you find between satisfaction with government and uh, subjective well-being. Mm. Of course, people can feel positive about their life and feel positive about government, so these are just positive people. So I think it would be useful if you could use a governance index from another source. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe also use time dimension, because you have some time dimension yeah. in the Afrobarometer uh, data. And secondly, when I saw your outliers uh, of subjective well-being, so the case of Uganda and mm -hmm, Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, Sierra Leone or Liberia was the other one, it made me think that actually what seems to be most important or extremely important for subjective well-being are shocks, so covariant shocks yeah. or idiosyncratic mm -hmm. shocks. And of course, you don't, do not have information on shocks in the uh, FO barometer right. uh, survey. So I was wondering whether the things you find, so the correlation between subjective well-being and income may be partly driven by positive shocks uh, mm -hmm. and negative shocks. So I think it would be worthwhile uh, thinking about that. Great, thank you. Do you want me to respond? Or wait? OK, great. Yeah. Great, OK. Yes, sir. I just want to find out. Uh, regards to the, uh, the data you used, uh, I was still trying to appreciate how you computed the consumption wealth index. Mm. Uh, I, you tried explaining it, but I was trying to get that, as if you could throw some highlight on that. But does your data permit you to do some disaggregation beyond, so looking beyond the community attributes? Uh, I'm asking because uh, depending who is responding to that service that you're okay. using, uh, the, the community attributes might vary slightly. For example, if there are persons living in a community with a disability, and uh, whether or not these people are captured in the data, and if it allows for disaggregation, and you're able to see what the variation would be. Uh, thanks, Erin. This is um, interesting, but I, I didn't... Uh, first, a clarification. Yeah. Your interaction effect is between the Gini index of the, within the reference group and the own consumption wealth or exactly. the community consumption wealth? The own. The own. The own. Yeah. All right. Then I... Okay, that makes it more interesting even. But I think then this, the why is that? I mean, the, okay, the, the, that, that just needs explanation, but um, interesting. Um, the second point, I think you're missing an important interaction effect, that you need an interaction effect also between the own income, the own consumption wealth index, and the community consumption wealth index. Um, the point is that in, if you go back to the paper with Lokshin, uh, we're at, we're actually we're not arguing that there is no relative deprivation effect in, in Malawi. We're arguing that it's not relevant for poor people in Malawi. Mm -hmm. In fact, we show there is a relative deprivation effect right. amongst better off people, particularly in urban areas. They, it's a, Malawi is a very high inequality country and you can see a, a huge differences in the importance of relative deprivation depending on your own level of living. And, and I think that's plausible when we tell a story about why that would be the case, but you're missing that interaction effect. I, I actually don't think it's going to show anything, but you might as well put it in. Okay. Mind like a sieve. If I don't write these down, they'll go away. Okay. <laughs> so thanks. These are these are all great questions, and um, this is indeed a work in progress. So this is very helpful. Uh, so first of all, that's adding a governance index is a great idea. I think um, that would be really really helpful. And I am quite interested in this idea of shocks, and especially thinking about work about set point theory and hedonic treadmills. And so in some ways, one would. You know, if, if set point theory is true, something like the extremely high subjective well-being one sees in, in Liberia wouldn't make sense, right? And so, so maybe there's a question here about, you know, a lot of the set point theory and hedonic treadmill sort of work is coming out of not nearly as catastrophic 
a set of circumstances as civil war and post-election violence and so on. So I think you're quite right. Maybe there are things like these sorts of shocks that really transform subjective well-being for a longer duration than maybe has been found in studies from the West. So that's, that's really exciting, and I need to figure out how one can do that. Um, the secondly, your, your question on data, this all can be disaggregated. Um, there are, uh, the Afro, Afrobarometer data are um, at the household level. And the reason initially why I aggregated up is in order to get reference groups, but then also I was quite interested in demographic and health survey, health information, in which I needed to kind of create communities. It turns out, um, or create community averages, it turns out those don't matter as much. But um, your, your point is taken that there is a lot of variation across communities and that's, I mean, across individuals in a rural area. And so to use a rural aggregate measure loses some of that. And, and I agree. Um, this kind of comes back to an issue with the Afrobarometer data where there's not a lot, within each particular country, there's, there's not a lot of variation across different regions. And so I'd have maybe eight people in one, you know, in one, um, region and maybe 12 people somewhere else, and so it was quite hard to figure out how do you estimate at that kind of, that degree of, of fineness. And so I think I have to kind of think about other, other data sets that would allow me to kind of get at that disaggregated point. But your point's well taken. Um, in, in terms of uh, Martin Revalian's points, I mean, absolutely, I, I didn't mean to sort of gloss over the findings of, of Lakshin and Revalian at all. I do think that there is a really interesting story there, and I think to me, what's quite interesting is for, for the poor um, respondents, finding neighbors and family mattering quite a bit is, is a really interesting mutual insurance kind of social protection piece um, that, that's really valuable. And I will certainly try to add, I will try estimating the community wealth index interacted with the own wealth index. I think that could be, could be quite fruitful. Um, and so what I find, thinking about the marginal effects, I don't think I have the slide with me, but the, the marginal effects when I'm varying the consum varying um, the consumption wealth index over the Gini, I don't find any statistically significant findings. It's only the it's only sort of this direction where I have specific genies for each community that I'm finding a small change in the consumption wealth index matters um, matters a lot. And I'm you know I, I, I'm not quite sure why. That might be. I think it might be that that the uh, an increase in, in a genie is, is maybe a little bit harder to harder for respondents to, to sort of maybe notice. I'm not sure. Um, it's a it's an interesting puzzle though as to why I'm finding it one way and not the other. Um, so, yeah. uh, thank you, Michael. This is um, interesting work. Um, I think you need to kind of go back to the subjective poverty lines now. Uh, in a sense, it's like it's not closed. I mean, if you start with your motivation of the concerns that the South African government had about the objective poverty measures, then to go back to those, you now have to construct the uh, subjective poverty line based on your regressions, which will then be a function of, in other words, fix the subjective welfare, back out the poverty line in money income space, which is now a function of all the other Xs, which include your social wage, now you've got a poverty line which properly reflects the, the social wage, as the government claims, and then redo the poverty measures with that me metric. And that's exactly the same as redoing the poverty measures with, a subjective, wel with subjective welfare, predicted subjective welfare. And I'd encourage you to use either predicted subjective welfare, which is exactly the same as using either the, sub the poverty lines based on money, on, on income, but subjective poverty lines, given that subjective welfare is monotonic in income. So I encourage you to do that rather than use what you call subjective poverty based on the answers to the question. Because I think the answers to the question are so contaminated by personality effects, heterogeneity in all kinds of ways. But I really believe there is a signal in the noise of subjective data and you've extracted that signal I think very well. Um, the other, just to briefly mention, uh, I've been doing now for a few years a, a project on trying to establish whether there are significant biases in the types of regressions you're using by using vignettes. What we do is we go to households, we ask them their subjective welfare, we've done it in three countries now, we ask them the subjective welfare, and then we describe people. 
you know, in some detail with their living conditions, how they live, or how much they eat and so on. And we ask the same respondents to tell us what the subjective welfare is of, of, is of those people. So that way we can recalibrate the scales and see if the regressions are significantly biased. The news is very encouraging in all three countries. There is a bias, but it's quite small. So you really can learn from these kinds of data. Actually, I think this is probably just an um, amplification of Martin's point, just to say that you know there's a, this uh, vigorous debate in South Africa about what the objective poverty line actually should be. Um, and I wondered whether in the earlier part of your paper you'd looked at what it would look like with several different objective poverty lines, because they're, they're very far apart and of course they reflect different opinions about what it means to be poor. Uh, feeding on from that a little bit then, uh, it does strike me as, as an interesting thing that you're asking one respondent in the household to talk about the subjective poverty of that household, but making a lot of, uh, a lot of your discussion is about the intra-household process and, and money metrics and, and intra-household. I don't know what the evidence says about whether, whether it matters who you talk to in the household and whether it's fair to actually to think that you've solved the issue with a single respondent from the household subjectively. Yeah, I think uh, on the issue of um, uh, subjective poverty lines, uh, my co-author and I have talked about this uh, uh, to some extent. Um, some of the addi additional things um, we've considered uh, are which measures of um, subjective well-being. We have a sort of battery of, of those types of questions. Um, so one of the first questions, uh, first two questions um, that we've discussed amongst ourselves are what you include on the right-hand side of the equation and what differences you might get based on what you include on the right-hand side of the equation with various combinations of the subjective um, types of questions. We also have the question uh, that you've used yourself and, and others have used in Albania, uh, the sort of uh, subjective ladder. So I mean, there, uh, there are sort of different options in terms of, of calibrating a subjective poverty line. Um, so we looked at this as a sort of a first attempt to um, see if we could uh, draw something out of, of what might be important before uh, sort of a significant next step. But, but that's something we've been um, sort of discussing at length. Um, uh, the second question, sorry, um, I didn't bring a pen uh, to the podium. <laughs> I was about the huge in Poverty lines. Poverty line. Yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't use uh, uh, different poverty lines. South Af that's the South uh, SA came out with uh, three. Um, so one possibility would be uh, some sort of robustness um, based on different poverty lines. They are quite different. I think what you would expect is as the objective poverty line gets lower, you'd have greater overlap between um, subjective and objective, but you might then find that uh, the protectors of social poverty change in their sort of order of importance. Um, that's something we're looking at, and we're not quite sure um, if it's going to be more of a robustness uh, check, or if it's something that could be, you know, worth exploring um, further. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Marie, I forgot yours as well. <laughs> it was just about uh, asking a single respondent of, of their subjective well-being and, mm. and thinking that that represents the household. Mm. Especially as you go on to make to talk a lot about intra-household things and equivalent scales and mm. and stuff. Yeah, I mean uh, the work that we found interesting there was uh, Bookwalter, um, who sort of looks at South African data and suggests that um, the the person responding for the household generally tends to uh, evaluate the well-being of the household based on household characteristics rather than personal characteristics. The difference with that work is. 
um, they had to assume that the head of the household was the respondent, whereas we got more nuanced data and were able to identify exactly um, who was responding. But whether that has an implication or how much further we could take it with this particular data. Um, and you know, obviously, uh, um, Dory, my co-author, and others have found that uh, when you control for individual level factors um, uh, from NIDS, where you actually get inf individual information on um, each individual in the household, it would make a difference. Um, and I, I would say a similar response to um, whether the, the person responding is a main income earner or um, her or his position in the household would probably make a difference. So we, uh, we weren't controlling for the individual uh, contributions of that person to the household, but we were, con were able to control for her or his uh, sort of personal characteristics, including health, education. So I think we maybe got at some of that. Um, but, but could do better, probably. Thanks very much. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, quick question, but maybe I'm missing something really basic, which, uh, so forgive me. But it seems to me that an interesting null hypothesis that, uh, that you could test in a more rigorous <laughs> way, perhaps, is whether employment leads to happiness. <coughs> that would seem to me um, probably a more, uh, well, a, a useful thing to look at, right? Because then you could use your the, you know, being in the treatment as the instrument for being employed. I don't know whether you've considered that. Um, it would just seem pretty obvious to me, um, the, as an as a addition to, to what you're doing. Sure, sure. Um, it, 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 trying to use happiness uh, in this way so directly for policy, uh, 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 to, to derive policy prescriptions is trem tremendously important, but I think there's one problem with it in the European happiness literature. Uh, there's a well it's well established that cha changes are much more important, have a much more important impact on happiness than levels. So you win the lottery, you're happy, mm -hmm. then you get used to it and you're miserable. You break your leg, you, you, you become crippled, you're miserable, you get used to it, you become happy again. And if an interve a temporary intervention like this you can imagine people become employed, they get used to it, they get, they're happy for a little while, they get used to being employed, the happiness goes back to the mean again. Mm -hmm. And whereas the people who were employed because of the voucher and then once the scheme ends or whatever intervention it is ends, they go back to where they were before, they're miserable. And so this will pull down the happiness impact of any temporary intervention. And I, I think this is an important, something that you have to examine in studies like this, or else you're going to be under-reporting the happiness impact of interventions. There, there seems to be a, another interpretation, I'm not sure about this, but let's walk through another story which suggests that your results are not at all surprising. If suppose that unemployment is picking up a latent personality trait, um, just bear with me, there's some um, latent personality effect which is constant and we know that personality influences the answers to happiness questions. It's hugely important in the psychological literature. So what would happen then, I mean if it is, you know, and, and there's a rationale for that as well, that, that it's a latent personality trait, the rationale would be that um, elementary economics, that holding constant income, uh, being unemployed just means you have more leisure, so your happiness should surely rise. Holding constant income, if you're not holding constant income, of course, there's not a different story altogether, but if you're controlling for income, um, you, you should expect that. So that all hangs together. It says, okay, unemployment effect is just a personality, latent personality trait. The economics and the psychology point in the same direction. What would happen then if you exogenously switch people into employment through your randomised control trial? Nothing. You would have no effect at all. So try, I mean, think it through. But, but if you did that, you see, if, it, if it's a personality trait, nothing to do with the, it's not an, uh, um, an effect of unemployment per se, it's an effect of a correlate of unemployment, which is in your error which is the personality trait, then the exogenous switching will have no effect because the personality trait is what's driving the, 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 the aspect of subjective welfare. 
Okay. Uh, well, great. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, uh, uh, very, very nice comments. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. But I mean, like when we started off, that wasn't that wasn't what we what we sort of were interested in. That's what I'm saying. It is the first round that we're actually presenting these results. Um, and we were hoping that we would find a little bit more on the active labor market policy itself, because that was, that was our interest. That was what we were supposed to evaluate. Um, so, but you're absolutely right. I mean, like, one can take this absolutely further from there. So, yeah, I agree. Um, so, in order, f yes, um, happiness as a policy, but rather sort of, so, so, and that, I think, is sort of the, the idea also of, uh, um, of the, the paper that I sort of don't like to say, if chair and the co-author. Um, um, because they also say, I mean, like, how long this, this effect might last okay, is not clear. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe one way for us to also look at it would be to see actually people that sort of transitioned into a job more recently towards the interview Okay, do they actually report difference? So, so can we use potentially the time dimension from transitioning and the interview as, as a measure for that? I think that might be a way forward to sort of try and unpack that. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the exogenous, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, like, but, but in order to do that, for, for, um, clearly we need the, the panel dimension. I would assume, or or not necessarily. I know, but I mean, like, <laughs> um, okay. But that that sort of would that go back to to basically your argument as well? I mean, so if if for example the personality trait, so if if it doesn't change, right? So it, it basically means also you, you basically just have a, a potential change. So your, your response is just to change, and then you come back to the, to the level that you would have anyway. Is that okay? I, I think it's a different point, but, but it's, okay. it's very hard to get in, in data on that. But I think there is, I know of, there's some Dutch work where they have these wonderful panels of the whole Dutch population, yes. which enables them to look at the question of is um, uh, to, to uh, compare employment experiences with, um, uh, with the subjective well-being. And they come up with a f came up with a finding a few years ago, I don't know whether they still would say this, that it's not unemployment that makes miser people miserable, it's miserable people who become unemployed, <laughs> which is okay. interesting. But, that, but that, that's my point. So it, I would need the panel dimension. Right. And, uh, like, but <laughs> No, no, but I, I hear what you... <laughs> um, what I'm saying is not something that you can go and test. Okay. It's, an, it's a theoretical interpretation I see. Okay. Of, the, of the argument. Now, now if I, if I put an empiricist hat on, how would I test it? Well, I would need either to control for personality attributes as data, or I'd need uh, vignettes. I'd need to, because the personality attributes are saying that the, the subjective welfare scales are contaminated by something in the error term. Mm. We have to clean that out. Yeah, so I'd need to recalibrate the scales using vignettes, or I'd need personality data. So uh, you, you don't have either. So that's not the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, sure. In a sense, you could, it's just to say, <coughs> when you think about the results, what do you yeah. learn from them? You, to, to clarify that may, there's this other interpretation, which you didn't, point to, and, and, I, and I can't see why it wouldn't be valid, um, just thinking it through intuitively. Sure. Yeah. I'll take that question just now, let me just uh, quickly. Um, so yes, we, we, we do have some information on the jobs, and um, the, the differences aren't significant. So, so the, the, the kind of jobs that you would get through the treatment are not necessarily different uh, to the jobs that people got in the control either. But so. They have burgers for two months that may not really make you happier. You may look for something more decent. And if that is not possible... Yeah. So, so no, absolutely. I mean, like, again, um, and it comes, down, comes back to the kind of, of uh, uh, sample that we've got there. Okay. Um, it is, it's predominantly l uh, less educated. 
So the kind of jobs that you would get would be contract and would be more uh, uh, menial. So, so um, they're, they're not very, very uh, demanding um, or most probably stimulating jobs, absolutely. And um, the one measure that we do have is actually sort of a self-reported measure if they're considered actually a job okay. that we started playing around with as well. So, but that, that's across uh, both groups. Well, so this is just to follow on Martin's point about another, you know, yet another uh, interpretation would be one of kind of a, a William Julius Wilson culture of poverty style interpretation where you have this astronomically high unemployment rate among a particular subset of the community and it's quite, or of, of a country and it's quite possible that, you know, as you, as you kind of hint at at the end, um, maybe employment is not something that they see as important to what makes them happy, you know, and, and if no one else around them, or very few people around them are able to get decent jobs, maybe that's not something that they're anticipating as being important for them. So. Okay, we have two here. Thank you very much. Okay.